Hello guys, uh, we're going to talk about pixel art procedure a little bit and I'm going to start by briefly going over this long tutorial because it's a really good reference and one of the most comprehensive I've seen but I'm just going to quickly go through it. You'll have to read it on your own if you want the full content and I'm going to put a link to this in the description as well. So this discusses uh, what is pixel art, how do you start doing pixel art briefly, um, some of the terms that you'll commonly encounter, things that you shouldn't do, and creating a color palette. So first, this whole discussion of what is and isn't pixel art, um, I don't really care about what is and isn't pixel art, just to say that if you are editing individual pixels, you're probably doing pixel art, or you're torturing yourself doing something way too big um, where you're putting in individual pixels for no reason. Uh, one of the main distinctions I've always seen is that if you can change just a couple of pixels, and the image looks entirely different, you're probably doing pixel art. Okay, But let's not get hung up on that too much and just go to the practical stuff instead. Um, how do you start is one of the first big questions a lot of people ask. And I've seen a couple of basic examples of how people do pixel art. This one is new to me where they kind of blob everything in and then slowly refine up. That's more like a traditional painting or drawing method. Uh, but I have seen this one where you create all outlines and then fill them in with local colors and then start detailing out the shade areas and then the detailed dithering areas or texture areas. That's a pretty good one as well. Um, and I've also seen one where you put in all of the basic silhouette shapes and color inside of those doing the outlines last or second to last. So any of those are good and I'll demonstrate some of them when we get into our practical uh, demonstration. Um, some terms that you should be aware of, anti-aliasing is this process of creating a smooth effect with semi-transparent or uh, color changing pixels such as this. You can see in the tiny thumbnail down in the lower right what the overall effect of those sorts of things is. Uh, if you are doing this in your pixel art then you are being a perfectionist or you are on to the polish stage. Don't do this early in your process and for you guys who are working in my class probably don't do this at all because this is a polishing and beautifying step. You don't usually need to do it but it is nice if you do it. Uh, dithering is the process of creating the appearance of color change or a gradient without actually having additional colors. One of the later pieces of advice says to limit your color palette, which is generally a very good thing. But when you have a limited color palette, there's a way to create the appearance of shading uh, using patterns like this. Again, you probably don't have to do this. It's nice if you do, but there's lots of pixel art that looks just fine with hard edged shadows and no dithering whatsoever. So if you're doing this, you're either onto your polish stage or you're being a perfectionist. So be careful about that, especially when you get up to interlaced dithering, which is much more complicated. Okay. Pixel clusters, this is the idea that pixels which are grouped together tend to make a shape and pixels which are not grouped together tend to make a piece of detail or texture. So you can just see in this tiny, tiny thumbnail, maybe you even can't, those two little pixels, but these two little pixels right next to this color change area make a sort of anti-alias effect. So it's kind of a, a broad concept to wrap your head around, but if you have a bunch of similar pixels near each other, they will make shapes and patterns. If you don't, then they're going to make call out details such as an eyeball, or a nostril, uh, or just some texture that you don't quite know what it is. Um, things to avoid doing too much anti-aliasing, like I was just saying. Um, doing too little can result in a jagged effect, but you don't have to do anti-aliasing at all, typically. Also, changing way too many colors in anti-aliasing, that's a bad thing. Jaggies is something that you may encounter, which is when the pattern of pixels is interrupted by a step or a single pixel is out of step from the pattern, it can create an unpleasant effect. So because of the limitations of pixels being square, we tend to observe certain kinds of pattern like a one step over, one step up kind of pattern for a slope, or two to one, or three to one, or something like that. And curves are particularly difficult because these are boxes that we're stacking around. So in this example here, this would create a sort of unpleasant effect, these different patterns but putting in some anti-aliasing can greatly smooth it. But now you can see close up how ugly this looks, but it looks great zoomed out. And so one of the things you're going to have to consider when you're making your pixel art is how close would you like people to view it? Uh, the closer you would like them to view it, probably the less anti-aliasing and dithering you're going to need. And the farther away, the more you would probably need that. Um, so avoid bad dithering, that's fine. We don't have to point that out. Um, here's an example of a dithered rabbit and a non-dithered rabbit. 
um, or actually just a minimally dithered one. You can see little bits here and it looks pretty nice. I'd actually say both of them look pretty nice zoomed out, but the one on the left definitely has kind of a waffle pattern to it, almost like there's a filter over top of it. Um, let's keep going down. Banding, so when you put one transitional color around every single group of color, it's usually a bad kind of uh, practice. You're not really thinking about where you're applying your color. You're just kind of mechanically going through those steps. So try to avoid that. Here's a very well thought out pattern of sort of anti-aliasing or sort of color transitioning. And you can see in the top that it looks a lot nicer. Um, doing the same sort of patterns with each one of your transitional colors can create fat pixels, which is just the same problem that you might have with um, jaggies or single pixels, but now it's even more noticeable. Uh, let's keep going down because you can read all of this. Pillow shading is another common one where the outside color is darker than lighter, 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 or the opposite where it's lighter, darker, darker, darker. That's generally a bad practice because it doesn't take into consideration lighting or form at all. It's just kind of a mechanical thing you would do. Better than doing this is doing no shading at all, I would say. If you just had to have a single color outline shape, I would prefer that to having pillow shading but nice shading tends to take into account there might be a lighting direction and a shadow side, just like you would do with uh, traditional painting. Okay. Uh, noise, I'm going to skip over that only to say that this tiny little pixel here is essential because the bird now has an eye and a beak, but this kind of discusses the problem of uh, individual pixels out of pattern and when you should use them. Um, sell out is an advanced uh, sort of technique where instead of just having an outline around a object, you have an outline that gets broken up with darker versions of the color and it creates a really pleasing effect. But again, this is more perfection and polish stage. And also the effect where you can use it to create a sort of thinning effect even on a single pixel line, which is really advanced and really nice. Okay, uh, Creating a color palette. So here we have someone's work process of starting kind of general and working towards specific and then detailing. Uh, here we have an example with a grayscale color palette and colored uh, figures here. The idea for a color palette is that the less colors, the better. Um, here we have an original Mario game where the colors are very, very minimal. Um, the less colors, the better, because higher contrast and greater difference tends to make pixel art more easy to understand and view, but it can also make it uglier. So that you have to strike a balance between how many colors you're using and how few colors you're using, and also how many tones of the same color. So in this example here, you can see a couple of pixels above and below that center line. Those are tones of the same color. So we've got these two, these two, and these two. Uh, over in here, we have three of these tones, two of these, two of these. Tones would be when you have essentially what is supposed to be viewed as the same color, a slight difference to create a shading effect or a slight transitional effect also limit the number of tones that you pick. Uh, too many tones can create a very messy or blurry kind of figure. Here's a nice example of these trees using a very limited color palette in which you appear to have green, but really it's just gray. Here's him advising you to stay away from the highest end of the saturation scale, except in uh, a few detailed areas. I agree with that. It tends to make it kind of uh, stab into the eyes as opposed to be pleasant to look at. And then here's a toned down version that's a lot nicer to look at. Um, here's an example with low contrast and high contrast. We tend to favor higher contrast with pixel art because it is small and uh, we have to kind of use our imagination sometimes when we're viewing it zoomed out. Um, going down a little bit more just to see a couple more examples. Hue shifting, yeah, we kind of covered that. I think that's about it for this tutorial. So just some basic best practices for this. Uh, and now I'm going to get into the practical stuff where uh, we're actually working with the editor. So here are four different potential sizes that you could be using. An 8x8 eight eight pixel size, a 16x16, 16 16, a 32, and a 64 size block. So I measured these out earlier so that we could determine uh, what size we might want to work at depending on what we're making and what the benefits and drawbacks are. So your assignment is to make fruit, and I'm going to use the example of a pear in my example here. And I've got a picture. One of the first great pieces of advice I can give you is have reference for whatever you're making. So get actual photographic reference of the thing that you're intending to paint or draw if it's possible. And if not, at least have some nice quality art or some influential art on hand that you can refer to. In this case, I'm looking at the shape 
and the color and maybe adding the detail of the stem and the leaf depending on what size I'm working at. So first thing that you might want to do if you're really excited to work in pixel art you might be tempted to go straight down to the smallest sizes so 8 or 16 because they're uh, considered to be like the most pure kind of colors that you could or the uh, sizes that you could work at um, when you think about pixel art you tend to think about big chunky kinds of detail like this so I'm going to erase the 8 there but we don't have very much space to work with in a very very small size like that's about it that's kind of all I can do I could make it a little bit bigger I do have some space to uh, slide this around let me just paste it there uh oh I deleted it there we go I'll just redraw it a little bit lower so I could go all the way up to these borders by the way the black is not included in the the space that's the border so I made sure to space these out a little bit so I'm trying to make what would eventually look like a pair in just this area and it's a bit difficult you know we don't have a whole lot to work with the pair had a smaller top and a larger bottom to it um, getting that difference with pixels of this size is quite a challenge sometimes and we tend to go to more symmetrical shapes eventually and then that looks a little bit dissatisfying to me I'd prefer a slightly less symmetrical shape but really with with this limited space like maybe that is about the the shape that I could make and then I have very little room to include things like the stem if I wanted to do that so I'm going to get a slightly tanner shape for like the stem I could pop it off to the side like that if I want a taller stem then I've got to erase away from my uh, pair and shave it down a little bit so that I get the right size something like that might do but it's starting to look a little bit lumpy like a mango or something so maybe about here and I could just about if I wanted to maybe add an extra little bit on the stem um, you can look up at the preview pane up here to see what is going to be noticeable and not and this is a very very small size so I could zoom out a little bit to kind of double check but it's just kind of going to be a green shape if we're viewing this at anything near monitor resolution um, zoomed in it maybe looks kind of charming and nice and retro but I'm not sure if I would be able to adequately re represent like shading details at this size uh, we'll come back to this one but let's pop up then to a larger one if you are not excited to do pixel art you might be tempted to go straight to the largest size so that it's less like pixel art right uh, it's more like digital painting and drawing at that point and you don't have to work with the limitations of small sizes so I'm gonna increase my brush size and then just gonna start drawing and it's like yeah I can do whatever shape I want here I can get very very high details because I've got a lot more pixels to work with um, the drawback is that you're responsible now for a much greater fidelity of appearance uh, I'm gonna have to switch to a tablet real quick so I'm drawing so big you're gonna be responsible for lots of shading lots of detail lots of lighting effects if you use this large of a size there's no getting around that because you've just got so much more space to work with that now small details matter more I might have to make the top of this a little bit fatter uh, I might have to worry about more shading layers I might have to be very picky about uh, all of the individual little pixel steps that I leave in here sorry I was just trying to draw that I might have to have things overlap a little bit to get more of a three-dimensional effect uh, it's more work but it's probably easier in general to just kind of get something looking nice on a larger scale like this but where you're gonna get hung up are in all the little details I think so I'd say that's about right for at least a basic pair size and I didn't even use the entire canvas I would have to draw even larger than this to get a full size you know sprite out of this and I almost hesitate to call it a sprite at 64 it becomes like low resolution art at that point uh, so the in-betweens tend to be a little bit more reasonable the 16 and the 32 size where the 16 is the one I tend to favor because it's small enough to be limited pixel art but big enough to get some details 32 also is a fairly common size that you can find pixel art um, done for because you're still small enough that each pixel matters but you're big enough that you can get quite a lot of details in there so with the 32 the same sort of process that I was using before where I'll probably make my brush a little bit bigger to make this easier fill in a big area try to get the shape 
relatively correct. And then I can detail and nitpick a little bit after that. I'm going to try to use more of the canvas this time. So an oblong kind of shape, leaning over to one side because that's what I like. Thinner on the top, wider on the bottom. Almost teardrop, but not quite. And then I could switch to my stem. And I think I'll go down to single pixel for this. Switch to my stem, and I can even get some details on that if I like. I could probably go with two. Maybe something like that or so is looking like a pair. Um, at least mostly. I think I would actually get rid of a little bit of the sides on the top here. So this is a nicer size to work at, a little bit more comfortable. Um, doesn't feel so restrictive. Also, it doesn't feel like I have a huge responsibility for um, filling in detail at a later point. Uh, maybe just some shadows, and I could move this if I want to. So if I cut and then leave it there. Oh, it keeps disappearing on me. I'm not sure why it keeps doing that. Let's uh, cut, and maybe I have to hit enter. No, I don't know why it's not doing that, but anyway, it's fine up there. Um, I could just move it manually or something like that or figure out what I'm doing wrong. Uh, the 16 size, let me zoom into that one. Uh, this one tends to be an, a fairly easy choice to make. I'm going to switch to the green again, fill in my shape, and it's not going to take very long because there's a lot less space to fill in. So wider on the bottom, thinner on the top. I want to leave some room for the stem. And we're just about there now. Might want to get rid of this row. Just about. Let's see, what if I did that? Yeah, looking at the, I like that shape a little bit more. I'm trying to avoid an avocado look as well, since those two shapes are very similar. And then just enough to get a little bit of stem detail. So there's all four now. Uh, looks like I left a few little bits of mess here and there somehow. Um, all four different sizes. And the method that I was using is, uh, I, I just call it a block out, where I'm drawing the shapes that I want and refining them with a single color and then I'm going to worry about the shading and detailing second after that. Um, that is not the only way that you can work. You could do an outline and then uh, worry about fill second. So just for a difference of approach, I'm going to erase, uh, or actually, no, I won't even erase. I'll come down here and just do uh, a basic example. I'll grab my green. And so this time, instead of filling it in, I'm going to imagine I just want the outline. I'm going to draw the shape that I intend, but then come back in and erase out every pixel that isn't on a single line like that and use that as my refining method. Um, I prefer to work with the fill because I feel it's a bit more free um, than doing this, but you could definitely do this if you want to. It in involves a lot of like deleting single pixels and moving one over and then trying something else and then kind of squinting your eyes or zooming out or looking at the, the thumbnail detail to get that idea. So we could say maybe something like this could work. Uh, and then with my other shape, since it was just single pixels for that one, I could fill it in. So this would be an idea for just the outline. You could do this all in black if you wanted to. Um, I'm not going to be able to easily replace all of these because I've got those colors elsewhere on the canvas. But you could do this all in black if you intended, or if you had a previously determined outline color for each shape area, you'd use like the darker green or the darker brown or something. But definitely filling in the entire thing like this, then worrying about colors is a way that you could go. And for the smaller size, we could do it as well. Just one more time. Probably fill in a few spaces like this. Try to get a nice pattern going see here. The smaller size you work, the more symmetrically I feel I start to get with the art. Yeah, see, now I'm fully back to a symmetrical look, and I don't really like that very much. So maybe something like that, and then I could put a stem up there and fill all those things in as well. So those two different methods tend to be the ones that are favored the most that I've seen, which is big block in and then worry about details, or outline first, then worry about the fill colors. Um, either way is fine with me. Okay. 
So what would we do after this? I've been working with a very limited color palette. I haven't even included the leaf green yet. Um, I would want to think about what needs to be shaded, and this is where my reference is going to come in handy. These are lit probably in a photo studio. There's some shadow underneath, which we'll ignore. We'll just let them float. Um, and there is texture on the surface, too. Should I render the texture? Hmm. Well, in the case of my large one, yeah, I might want to. I've got a lot of pixels to deal with. But in my 32, 16, and 8, probably not. That's too small of a detail to represent. Uh, but I am going to need some shadows and some light, and I can see where those things are occurring on the surface. So typically, I'm going to start with one of my colors like this green here. So that one. And then I'm going to try to change to a darker or lighter version of this. If you just move straight up or straight down, you're going to get a um, relatively controlled effect, but probably a boring one. So I'm just going to go straight down from that color and then paint in here. Um, my color palette is set to current, so now I've got both those different colors there. And this would probably do for a nice shading effect. I'll use this uh, 32 size one. And I'll just draw a semicircular shape on the side and then fill it in with my paint bucket. Okay, And now I could uh, switch my secondary color to my original green here. I thought I could. Oh, there we go. I had to left click and my secondary color to my shading color. And so now I can right click to remove the shadow and left click to add more to get a nice kind of shape. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe not. OK, um, that'll do. And we can kind of see in the preview we've got like a shadow shape there. Uh, but what you could do also, uh, you could move the rainbow slider around. If you move your shadows typically towards a cooler, as in a bluer color, um, you tend to simulate what happens in the real world with sky um, lighting shadows. And the sun lighting uh, highlights would shift us towards yellow or maybe red, probably more towards yellow, really. Um, and if you do that with your highlights, then you can get sort of a richer color palette. So this was just slid towards um, the dark side, not moved at all. But I'm going to slide this color slider towards blue pretty significantly as well. Uh, and then show you the difference between those two colors. So you might be able to see, maybe not, uh, that this is a lot bluer than this one is. And I find that that tends to look a lot more pleasing to me. I'll use this one on the smaller shape up here. So now I've got all of those in my color palette. So we'll drop in some shading, kind of like this. I'll use the bucket. And then I can right click to remove a little bit, uh, probably more like that, and left click to add. So you can probably see the difference there. Let me fill this back in and get rid of whatever I did, something like that. Um, so you can probably see the difference there. I find that this is a lot richer, and so I tend to prefer it. but. Um, it's up to you. A more monochrome color palette is a little calmer and a little bit more boring. Uh, more dynamic, especially if you went very crazy with this, would be more exciting and more contrasted, but you might not want that. Uh, let's pick a uh, highlight color as well. So I'm going to start with my base tone, which I just selected, and then I'm going to go lighter. Uh, we tend to also go a little bit desaturated uh, with highlights, but then we can slide this towards yellow. So something like that. And let's see how that looks. I like that color. Looks pretty nice. I think my reference has a much yellower um, pair, but I don't really mind that. And so my highlights are going to go on the opposite side as my shadows. And I'm also going to try to take into consideration that there's a sort of bulge here in the center that needs a little bit of shading as well. Let's go something like this. Might go that far, uh, or I could remove a little bit of this because highlights won't necessarily wrap around that entire side. They could be floating in the middle here somewhere. I think I'll get rid of that one and just say, this is fine for me. Maybe a little bit. No, yeah, I kind of like this. Okay, We could do the same thing over here where we've got this kind of bulging area in the center and then also these highlights which need to go across the top here. I could allow for some cast shadow if I wanted to. And then I just want to nitpick it a little bit and shape it a little bit more nicely. So 
Yeah, maybe something like that. I feel like this isn't quite working. Mm, close enough, I guess. Well, we'll just say it's close enough. It's really easy to get into the details and nitpick it forever. So try not to do that. Try not to be too much of a perfectionist, but do try to get a nice appearance on your object. Um, and it's a, it's a fine balance. It's just something you've got to learn. Uh, let's really briefly just go onto this really small one and see, can I apply these colors that I was just mixing up here to this little one and get any kind of nice effect? Uh, I'll start with the shadow because that's probably easier to just fill in like edge pixels like these. So yeah, that kind of looks like a shadow. And then highlights, I could put in just a couple. If we look up here in our preview or if we zoom out, how much more detailing can I really do on that little one before it starts harming the appearance? I really think that's it. That's all I can do for that small one. Uh, if I put in many more pixels than that, it starts to look like a secondary shape. And that's part of the problem with working too small is that it feels like less work, but it becomes really nitpicky when you zoom out or when you're trying to fit it into a scene. So I would recommend the 16 or 32 for anybody who's just starting out. Um, another question, we've got our stem there. Do we need shadow tones on our stem? Do we need highlight tones on our stem? When our stem is a single line of pixels, my answer is typically no. Uh, there's just not any room for shading on that. Uh, if it gets up to this size where I've got more than one pixel, then sure. But you run the risk of creating fat pixels or a secondary shape that you didn't intend. I'll start from the base tone, slide it a little bit darker, and then I'll also, I'll slide it away from yellow, which would be towards red in this case, for my shadow side, and fill that in. And I can already see that's far too contrasted, way too much contrast there to kind of qualify as a shading area. So I'm going to repick this, try one more time. I'm going to slide it just a little bit down, just a little bit away from yellow. That's a lot better. Okay, so if I put this on the shadow side, it might look something like this, where we've got a little bit of contact shadow or the divot that is going to go down into the pair and a lit side, but it already looks a little bit too uh, too detailed to me. I'll switch back to this other color for my secondary and get rid of some of that. Let's see, maybe something like this would be okay. Uh, it's a little tough to say. Over on this one, we would need a significant amount of shadow because we've got a huge turning form here and maybe even details on the the cap of this stem because we've got so much to work with and we also might need additional transitioning tones for this because there's a lot going on so that is going to start us out there and then i would probably need to fill in the shading areas of this large space as well so i'll switch to my i think what's my neutral tone is it that one let's see yeah it's that one and then i'll switch to my shadow color. I'll choose the, the um, one where I shifted the hue because I like it more. And then come over here and start drawing in this very large shadow shape. Oops, need to switch. There we go. This very large shadow shape. And if you block off the shadow shape, you can use the bucket to fill in the uh, lion's share of the shape, which will save you a lot of time, even if it's not correct yet, because now I can go back and just right click to fill in my uh, neutral tone and left click to fill in more shadow. So we might need an additional shape here where we've got this little divot because of that fat area in the middle. I'm going to keep carving away at this a little bit like that. And as it gets higher and higher up, thinner and thinner. So we've got maybe a, a cast shadow here slightly on the side of this stem. Um, something like that. I may have gone a little bit too far with that. Um, is going to be pretty much okay. We could even fill in, I think I've flattened it out a little bit on the bottom, so add one more row of details there. Looks a little bit nicer in the preview. The This shape, whoops, this shape over here I wasn't liking very much, so I could erase away and then fill in. There we go, just a little bit. So I'm looking up at the preview to see if the, the pattern looks okay, and really not exactly, but I'm going to resist the urge to perfect this and keep lecturing. Uh, let me switch to the highlight then. And just like before, we had this sort of highlight shape wrapping around. And sorry if you can hear that on the microphone. My son is a little bit upset in the next room. Uh, I'm going to put highlights up here. 
and try to fill that in as best as I can. Be a little bit more generous on the side here. And then we could perfect it by trying to carve away, get just the right shapes. And it's probably going to take some time for something this large to get exactly the shape that you would prefer. And so just be prepared for that amount of work if you want to work in this higher resolution thing. Um, zooming out, we can kind of compare all of the various examples that I've done here. Um, going back to what they were talking about, like dithering and anti-aliasing of lines and such, uh, the only one that really needs any kind of dithering, I think, would be this large one. Uh, Piscal does have a tool for that, by the way, this one right here. If I choose the um, shadow color and then I start left-clicking and dragging, you can see it will only fill in every second pixel, which is nice. And if you look up here at the preview, you can see there's a softness that's been created in that area because of that effect. So that would be the usefulness of dithering. And it's helping because this is so large and these color areas are so big that we do need to start using this for a bit of extra uh, detail. Oh, the dithering tool, unfortunately, it, f it fills in the same checker side no matter if you're in the primary or secondary color. I was hoping I could carve away by holding down right click, but apparently not. Um, well, that would be a nice feature, but it's OK. It's a very good tool regardless. So I could fill back in some of that zone with just the uh, uh, normal uh, whatever drawing tool, pencil tool, pen tool, they call it, pen tool. And so we can sort of shape that out. If we do this over here, and it, I do have a second uh, shading color for this one, it's going to probably be fine, but it might be a little bit too much detail for this small size. Let's give it a shot and see, something like that. Uh, if we look in the preview, actually, that looks OK. That would be all right. To do, but we don't want to do it wrapping all the way around here where we just can't keep that pattern going for very long. Okay. Oh, it does include the secondary color. So I, it's coloring uh, in a checkerboard pattern with both these, so I could go into the shadow area or out of either way. So that is nice. Uh, then I can clean it up just a little bit, get rid of some of the dots that I really don't think should be there, add a little bit of extra ones, and it's fine. That's, that's working. It looks good. Uh, up here, there's just no way. For 16, I don't think there's any chance, and for 8, definitely not. I don't think we could do it in either case up there. Okay. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, instead of doing it this way, you could use a second layer for your shading, which is something I've liked to do. Uh, I'm going to get my bucket tool and fill in this whole area, because I think it's the only, or actually I'll paint every pixel. This is the only color that I use. Those other two are different. Yeah, there we go. Um, this one, though, I'll just use the normal bucket fill that in. So now I've got a blank uh, pair. Let me get my, there we go, the stem blank as well. Uh, I'm going to create a second layer. You can see it dims the first layer. I'm zoom in up here. And so I could pick a uh, full opacity shadow color and then turn the transparency of that channel down. So this would be another way that we could work. So in this case, I'm just going to pick what color do I want my shadows to be just globally. So like a kind of gray blue color. Uh, and then paint that in somehow. And since I don't have my fill space here, I want to be careful and trace the outline. Oh, I want my secondary color to be transparent. There we go. That way I can use it as an eraser. So I'm going to fill this in and then bucket it so that it's completely filled. And now in your preview um, up there, you can probably see it's just blue right now. But if I click the little letter A and turn the opacity down to like half, then in our preview, which I'll go ahead and pop out so that we can see it larger. There we go. So that's the preview right now. Um, it's almost the same as when I use this color picker. So if I turn this layer off entirely, oh, my preview window is gone. Let me go find that. Uh, preview window. Where did it, let me cancel that. Where'd you go, preview window? Let's see. Oh, I'm, I think it did close it. Yeah, I don't see it popped up anywhere. Okay, well, anyway, I'll turn this off entirely by going zero. And now in our preview, right, it's completely gone. Uh, or I could change it to a very low number like 0.2. And you can see the shadow has come back. There's no nice kind of slider for opacity in pixel, so uh, piscal, so it's a little hard to uh, notice. But uh, if we mess around with these numbers, we can 
get whatever density shadow we want. I could use this uh, double for the uh, highlights if I wanted to. Just pick whatever actual color of highlight, like I'll choose a yellow desaturated color. Um, draw a couple of shapes up here. And then in my preview, I should be able to see a nice mixed color because the opacity is turned down. So if you'd like, you can do that. And uh, the benefit of this, the only one that I can think of really, is that if you wanted to have highlights on lots of different things in your scene, all those highlights could consistently shift those colors the same direction. If you use this method, I'm just gonna fill in every corner like that. Um, so if you had red things, you could have this same color over the top of red and it would mix. Or if you had blue things, you could use the same color over the top, it would mix. But in this case with a single subject, it's probably not worth doing this extra step. Uh, but in a very complicated scene, it would be a way to keep your color palette low while still getting more perceived mixed colors uh, in the end, which would be a nice working method. Okay, So that's just a brief kind of uh, working uh, overview of how I might approach making you know sprites of each of these different sizes, some of the pluses and, and drawbacks of working in each one of these sizes, and a little bit of demonstration of working process. So I hope that helps you guys.